Hey, do you want to hear a joke? Great, because I'm going to do this anyway. So I was hanging out with the filmmaker Christopher Nolan, you know, the director of such great films as Interstellar, The Dark Knight, Memento, and Inception. That's Inception. And he said to me, David, do you want to hear a joke? I said, yes, of course. He said, great, because I'm going to do this anyway. So, he said, there's a guy called Vladimir, and Vladimir works in a factory that makes Russian nesting dolls, you know, the Matryoshka dolls that nest inside each other. And this factory is actually in Swansea, and Vladimir is actually a second-generation Portuguese immigrant named after his uncle on his mother's side, just in case you think I'm making any lazy stereotypes about Russian culture. Um, and so one morning on a Monday, uh, Vladimir comes into the factory 15 minutes before the alarm goes to indicate the start of the working day, and he bumps into his friend Anatoly, who also works there. And Anatoly is drunk on vodka, reading a book on Marxism and interfering with the 2016 American presidential election. And Anatoly looks at Vladimir and says, Vladimir, you don't look well. You know, Vladimir says, yeah, I don't feel too good. You know, sometimes I look in the mirror and I don't even recognize the person staring back at me. And then I realize I'm actually just looking out of a window. That's terrible, says Anatoly. Well, you know what? To cheer you up, do you want to hear a joke? Yeah, of course, says Vladimir. That's great, says Anatoly. You know what? I'm going to tell you the most politically correct joke I know. So, he said, there's an Englishman, an Irishman, and a Scotsman. And they're all women, with vibrant and well-written inner lives. And they're standing in the middle of the desert watching a snake eat its own tail. And the Englishman, whose name is Katie, points to the snake and says, Ah, snake, sad, like that, because I can't really write convincing dialogue for female characters. And she turns to her two companions, both of whom have names and have conversations about subjects other than men, and says to them, this snake eating its own tail is really sad, so to cheer us up, do the two of you want to hear a joke? And they say, yes, of course. She says, great, because I was going to do this anyway. So the French mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot is sat in his study working on the mathematics of fractals. No, in the Catherine. I said, Chris, that's an obscure reference. I don't get it. He said, it doesn't matter. As long as you've understood the first few sections of the joke, you can just extrapolate forwards and then look up any references you don't know when you get home. And I said, well, that seems extremely reasonable and not at all alienating for an audience. Bwam, bwam, bwam. Probably, I don't know, I haven't seen it in a while. So the French mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot is sat in his office working on the mathematics of fractals and suddenly he hears a knock at the door. No, je ne regrette rien. It just reminded me of a good knock-knock joke. Knock-knock. And you say, who's there? And I say, uh, it's Jehovah's Witnesses. And you say, Jehovah's Witnesses. And I say, no, no, it's just, you know, because just they come around, don't they? Bwam, bwam, bwam. So I'm doing the Hans Zimmer soundtrack to the film Inception. If that's not clear, it, it does matter. So anyway, the French mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot is in his study, he's working on the mathematics of fractals, he hears a knock at the door, so he goes to the door, he opens it, only to see the back of himself opening the door through which he can see the back of himself opening the door through which he can see the back of himself opening the door through which he can see the back of himself opening the door through which he can see the back of himself opening the door through which he can see the back of himself opening the door, stretching off into infinity. He turns behind him only to see a door being opened by himself through which he can see a door being opened by himself through which he can see a door being opened by himself through which he can see a door being opened by himself through which he can see a door being opened by himself, also stretching off into infinity. He starts freaking out. He turns to the copy of himself behind him. He says, I'm freaking out, but to calm me down, do you want to hear a joke? And the copy of himself says, yes, of course. He says, great, because I'm going to do this anyway. So, she says, the late 20th century experimental writer Italo Calvino is sat in a Parisian bistro writing a book and no, I get there again. I said, Chris, that's an even more obscure reference than the last one. I don't get it. I don't know anything about 20th century experimental writing or the Ulipo movement. He said, it doesn't matter. Can you see what I'm doing with the levels and things and it's like the film and I make the noises and you go up and down? I said, yeah, no, no, I get it. Bwam, bwam, bwam. Wait, what's that noise, says Vladimir. Well, says Anatoly, that's the alarm to indicate that we have to start work. Because if you remember, we got here 15 minutes before the start of work, and now that 15 minutes has elapsed. No, Sinagatarian! I said, Chris, how can 15 minutes have passed? According to my watch, it's only been five. He said, well, when you tell a joke, your brain function is accelerated and your mind works quicker. Therefore, time seems to move more slow. So what's five minutes in our joke is actually 15 minutes in their joke. And when you enter a joke within a joke, then that effect is compounded. Bwam, bwam, bwam. 
There's the alarm again, says Anatoly. We'd better get to work. They play the second alarm one minute and 30 seconds after the first one. But wait, says Vladimir, you haven't finished telling me the joke about the Englishman, the Irishman and the Scotsman who was standing in the middle of the desert watching a snake eat its own tail. You're right, says Anatoly. I'll finish that joke. So the Englishman, Irishman and Scotsman, who are all women, are standing in the middle of the desert watching a snake eating its own tail. And the Englishman, whose name is Katie, is 45 minutes into telling her joke when suddenly she's interrupted by the Scotsman, whose name is Roisin, because she was actually born in Ireland but then moved to Scotland when she was two when her mother got a job as a procurement officer with a large pharmaceutical company based on the East Coast. And Roisin says, no, 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 no. That's not a joke. I'll tell you a joke. It's that jet fuel can melt structural steel. That's a joke. Wake up, sheeple. Because it's 2018, and women can believe that 9-11 was an inside job just as well as men can. No, Chris, I said, a 9-11 joke? That seems a bit out of character for you. He said, no, you're wrong. I love 9-11 jokes. In fact, it's a shame we don't have more time, because normally what I like to do is tell one 9-11 joke now, and then tell another one, unexpectedly, 17 minutes later. Oh, what? Too soon? Should it be 18, 19 minutes? I said, Chris, but wait, you need more time. We can get more time. All we need to do is move down a joke. Bwam, bwam, bwam. So the late 20th century experimental writer Italo Calvino is sat in a Parisian bistro writing a book and next to him is sat the other late 20th century experimental writer Georges Perec who's reading a copy of Laurence Stern's The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, a gentleman, when No, Sinergetarian! Chris, I said, this joke is becoming too long and too complicated and I'm just telling you in my professional role as a junior executive at Paramount Pictures that it's not going to connect with the general audience. And he said, well, you say that, but this is one of the biggest grossing jokes of 2010. I said, no, Chris, you listen here. And he said, no, you listen to me. Do you want to hear a joke? I said, yeah, of course. He said, great, because I'm going to do this anyway. So Chris said, I was hanging out with the filmmaker Michael Bay. You know, the director of such great films as Transformers. And Transformers 2, Revenge of the Fallen. And Transformers 3, Dark of the Moon. And Transformers 4, Age of Extinction, and Transformers 5, The Last Night, and The Island. That's The Island. And I was telling him exactly the same joke that I'm telling you now. And he said to me, Chris, why have you wasted all this time coming up with this joke that's too long, too complicated, too obscure, and won't connect with the general audience, when what you should have been doing is spending that time crafting a nice, tight, five-minute set that you could take around a series of open mic comedy nights and it's designed to work with a variety of crowds. And then, after you've been on the comedy scene for a while, you might get entrusted with an eight- or ten-minute set, at which point you could deliver an extremely cut-down, bastardized and butchered version of this joke and then once you've been on the scene for two three four five years you might eventually get a 15 or 20 minute set at which point you could deliver the entirety of this joke but until then you should be aiming small unambitious and populist also he said you need to sexy up your act a bit throw in some swear words that always gets some easy laughs and how about putting in some sexual fantasy people love that stuff like a bit of role playing in the bedroom like doctors and nurses or sexy high school cheerleader and school shooter sexy stuff like that let me show you how it's done so do you want to hear a joke yes of course says christopher nolan great says michael bay because i was going to do this anyway so he says exterior day we open on a hot young teenage waitress in a Parisian bistro. She's 15, but the actress playing her is in her 20s, so it's okay. The camera follows her as she walks, filming just below the hem of her tiny skirt as she walks over to some fucking boring literary guys writing some fucking boring books or whatever. She bends over seductively. Hello, boys. Do you want to hear a joke? Yes, of course, they say. Great, she says, because I was going to do this anyway. So she said... Dr. Evil and Mini-Me are eating a turducken, and it costs one million dollars, probably. I don't know, I haven't watched it in a while. And Dr. Evil says to Mini-Me, hey, do you want to hear a joke? And Mini-Me says, yeah, of course. And Dr. Evil says, great, because I was going to do this anyway. So he said, someone's hanging out in the countryside, telling a joke about how they were hanging out with the filmmaker Christopher Nolan. You know, the director of such great films as The Prestige, Batman Begins, Dunkirk, and Inception. That's Inception. When suddenly they realise that they're actually a character being written in a book by Italo Calvino as he sits at a Parisian bistro along with the other late 20th century experimental writer, Georges Perec. 
And Georges Perec is reading a copy of Hamlet. And as he's reading it, he says, Hamlet famously has a play within a play written by the character of Hamlet and designed to mirror and comment upon the reality of the play itself and Hamlet's own suspicions about it, namely that his father's been murdered by his uncle Claudius. Yet surely if the play within a play is meant as a mirroring and commentary of the higher reality of which it is part, then we can only really read the play itself, i.e. Hamlet, as a mirroring and commentary of the high reality of which it, it itself is part, namely the reality in which William Shakespeare exists. So I would argue that the only true interpretation of the play Hamlet is that it is actually about William Shakespeare's own fear that his father has been murdered by his uncle. And Italo Calvino says, yeah, that's great, but what do you think about my book? And George Perec says, no, no, it's great. It's got all the levels and you make the noises and it's like the film. In fact, I really like these two main characters, uh, the filmmaker Christopher Nolan and the guy who's telling the joke about him. And actually, I've got a good idea for your book if you want to hear it. And uh, Italo Calvino says, yeah, of course I do. George Perec says, great. OK, so do you want to hear a joke? Italo Calvino says, yeah, of course. George Perec says, great. Because I'm going to do this anyway. So the filmmaker Christopher Nolan and the person telling a joke about him walk into a factory that makes Russian nesting dolls. Bwam! 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 But wait, says the copy of Benoit Mandelbrot interrupting the original Benoit Mandelbrot's joke. I've got an idea. So if they're going through a factory, why don't they bump into someone called Al? So then he would be Factory Al and he can let out an exclamation when he sees them. Because it's, it's, it's maths joke because we're mathematicians. So me and Chris are walking around a factory that makes Russian nesting dolls when suddenly we bump into Vladimir and Anatoly. And Anatoly is just describing how me and Chris are walking around a factory that makes Russian nesting dolls. But wait, says Vladimir, you haven't finished telling me the joke about the Englishman, the Irishman and the Scotsman who are standing in the middle of the desert watching a snake eat its own tail. OK, says Anatoly, I'll finish that joke. So he said, the Englishman and Irishman and Scotsman, who are all women, are standing in the middle of the desert watching a snake eating its own tail when suddenly the Englishman, Katie, looks down and realizes that the snake is dead. Oh no, she said, it must have suffocated. I mean, I guess that makes sense because we've been here for about two and a half hours. But she turns to her companions and says, the snake's dead. I mean, I don't know if any of you are religious and want to say anything. I mean, personally, I don't believe in any of that imaginary friend in the sky nonsense. I mean, I had an imaginary friend once when I was young, but then I imagined the Atlantic Ocean and he drowned. Well, says Roisin, I'm not religious, but I am very spiritual, you know, so I don't believe in God in the traditional sense, but I do believe in the great god Cthulhu, who reigns from the sunken city of Relay. I believe in Azithoth and Yugsuthoth, in Yalafotep, the crawling chaos, and in Shub Niggurath, the great black goat of the woods with a thousand children, so I guess I'm an agnostic. So she makes the sign of the ancient ones and reads a couple of words from the Necronomicon and the snake starts to disintegrate into a substance and shape that's conveniently indescribable and beyond words. But wait, says Roisin, if we've been here two and a half hours, then we need to get in the car and get to the airport. Because if you remember, we're here on holiday, so we need to go home. What are you talking about, says Katie? We've got an extra day left. Nurses, Roshin, don't you remember? We wanted an extra day, but we couldn't afford it because we're women. And as of 2017, the full-time median gender pay gap in the UK, based on hourly earnings, stands at 9.1%. So we couldn't afford 9.1% of the holiday, which is a shame, as I presume that's where the punchline is. But wait, says Katie, if all we need to get to the punchline is more time, we can get that by just simply going down a joke. Well, sure, says Roisin. I mean, that would seem to undermine some of the socio-cultural commentary that we're trying to make in favour of indulging at what this point is a pretty masturbatory structural conceit. But yeah, sure, I guess we can do that. But wait, says Katie, looking over the sand dunes. Who's that? And they look up to see myself and the filmmaker Christopher Nolan walking towards them. Wait, says Katie, have we gone up a joke? No, I said, no, we've come down. We've come down. And actually, we're going down a few more if you want to join us. So, an Englishman, an Irishman and a Scotsman walk into a Parisian bistro along with myself and the filmmaker Christopher Nolan and everyone's there. There's Italo Calvino and Georges Perec, the late 20th century experimental writers. There's Vladimir and Anatoly along with Factory Al. The mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot. There's Michael Bay, Michael Bay's fancy waitress. There's even Dr. Evil and Mini-Me there. And I turn to the Englishman, Katie, and I say, well, this is great. You know, now that you're down here on this joke and you have more time, you can finally get to the punchline of your joke so Vladimir can hear it. 
And she says, well, actually, you know, we've been talking about this on the way down here, and we've actually decided to withhold the punchline of this joke as a protest against the gender pay gap. And I said, well, that's, that's great. You know, I fully support that. I'm an ally. And she says, well, you say that, but you're not so much an ally as a poser, aren't you? I mean, would an ally really consistently refer to the only three women in their joke as men? and then have the only other woman be a construction of heterosexual male fantasy. And then she looks around the table and she goes, actually, Italo Calvino, how much are you getting paid for this joke? And uh, Italo Calvino looks up from writing, he tears a page out of his book, writes a number on it and slides the paper across the table to her. She picks up the paper and goes, this is exactly what I'm fucking talking about. How come he is getting paid more from this joke than I am when I'm in this joke more and have a larger speaking role? This is exactly the stuff that we're protesting about. And I said, well, I think you're conflating the gender pay gap with equal pay, which are two separate issues. And she says, shut the fuck up, David. You know, you think that this is all so clever, don't you? This joke with its different levels and the characters and so on. But it's not clever. It's hollow and empty and meaningless, just like you. And with that, the Englishmen, Irishmen and Scotsmen storm out of the Parisian Bistro. And I didn't know what to do. So I turned to the filmmaker Christopher Nolan, you know, the director of such great films as, well, you know. And I said, Chris, do you think I'm clever? And he said, yeah, yeah, no, I thought the joke's clever. You got the different levels. It's like my film, and you make the noises and, and, and so on. It's, it, uh, but, I mean, if you want some feedback, what I'd say is, what what's it about? You know, in my film, Inception, I'm able to take the audience through this quite complicated series of formal and temporal constructs by allowing them to relate to and identify with the main character, Cobb, as played by Leonardo DiCaprio, and his emotional journey as he tries to reconnect with his children and deal with his guilt and grief over the loss of his wife. But, I mean, what's your joke about? You make these overtures towards socio-cultural commentary, but then back away in favour of indulging in this intellectual game that you've set up. And I... I think far too often this joke just feels like showing off. And I think it's very telling that you didn't ask me whether I thought the joke was funny or you didn't ask me whether I thought the joke was clever. You just asked me whether I thought you were clever. I mean, what is it about you? Why are you so obsessed with showing off to people and showing off to them about your intelligence or how clever you are? And I said, I don't know, Chris, I guess... I foreground my intellect because I'm ultimately worried that there's nothing underneath. I can't write an emotional arc for a joke because I don't feel anything. I don't feel any emotions. I don't know if there's something wrong with me, but I just feel numb and hollow and empty all the time. You know, a family member died last year and the only thing I felt was something comparable to when I found out that they weren't going to make mini-discs anymore. Just, oh, it's sad that this thing won't be in the world anymore. I think Katie was right. This joke is hollow and empty and meaningless. Because it's like me. And sure, it's great not being able to feel sadness, but... What's the point in living if you can't feel joy? <laughs>